give all that glory to Jesus. Amen. Wow. I was just about to uh, give honor to our campus pastors, and she hands me this text. And church texts are good texts, you know what I'm saying? So this past week, Paula and I uh, were privileged to go to one of our campuses. We went to the uh, Lexington, Kentucky area campus. It's located at Monos Coffee in Nicholasville, if you're familiar with the Lexington area. And God is doing great things there. And we were able to take them some updated PA equipment. And we were able to bless them financially. We were able to uh, bring supplies, Bibles, baptism books, visitor cards, tithing envelopes, river ink pens, anointing oil, all that good stuff. And um, they're growing. They're doing uh, a lot of good in their community. Uh, they shared with us a testimony. The Ukrainian Pentecostal Church, just up the road from their coffee shop, back when the war, uh, the attack on Ukraine first started, they decided they would take it on themselves to raise money for bulletproof vests and medical supplies. They asked Manos Coffee to be a part of it. So they came up with the idea that they would take Manos uh, roasted coffee. They roast their own coffee there. They got a big, humongous, amazing roasting machine, roaster. So they took Manos Coffee, they prayed over it, and they auctioned it off. And from 25 pounds of Manos Coffee, the Ukrainian Pentecostal Church raised $52,000. Isn't that cool? It's really important what God is doing through you and through these campuses. And you can give to those campuses. And one of the things that I wanted you to pray about is they are ready for a nursery. Yes. Amen. So they're meeting in one room, and that can be challenging. And uh, we've done it here for a few years, and uh, we watched. I remember when we opened the first nursery, and uh, it was a little bitty box in little room back behind the stage over there uh, in the old chapel. And we didn't really have any babies, but somebody said, I feel like the Lord wants us to open a nursery. And we went to a daycare up in Powell and collected cribs and brought them in and painted them up and put them in there. And within a few weeks, there were seven babies. It was, they said, we've outgrown the nursery already. God knew those babies were coming. And some of those babies are sitting in this room today holding babies. How about that? And I believe that what we've done here will be multiplied in Lexington, Kentucky. Amen? So I'm looking for donations for a nursery. They're just going to box in one corner of the coffee shop. And they've got the perfect little place for it right close to the bathrooms. And it's just going to be a real simple uh, probably $6,000 deal and done. And that is if I go down and do it. <laughs> and I can't wait. And so if you've got building skills, uh, trade skills along those lines, and you've got a couple of free days coming up, you let me know, and I'll have the materials dropped off there, and we'll go do that. Wouldn't that be fun? Go to Lexington for a day. All right. So, this is what I just got from my wife for life. Happy Valentine's. A picture of today's service. After we prayed over their space, they today had seven new visitors plus three visiting that were last week visitors came back again this week. Now, how about that? 
Hallelujah. And I think I saw where they said they counted wrong. They really had eight new visitors. <laughs> Amen. So God is moving. Your prayers are working and your contributions and donations to them on a regular basis. We support them regularly, monthly, as part of our mission. So if you give to missions or you give to uh, the Kentucky campus, we pass that along. And uh, it helps us to, to keep them uh, what they need going there. And I love that. Amen. Continue to pray for Jim Lipka. He was here last Sunday. He had some surgery this week, uh, like a follow-up surgery. And he's uh, recovering well and supposed to come home Tuesday. I know everybody's praying for him, but continue that prayer because God is working. Good things are happening. So to me, it's still the beginning of the year. You know what I mean? Like... August or something, I'll probably figure out that it's 24 and quit writing 23, right? But it's the beginning of the year. We've been teaching on love. We've been teaching on, uh, Lindsay taught on he's in the waiting. Did you remember that message? And last week we taught on the importance of knowing God's love from the other side, the severity of God's love that he judges and he's a God of justice. Amen. And so that's, that's a key component of what we're building on this year. And I've taught on foundations for ever since we started the river, 28 years and some months. And we're going to revisit that today because we have a lot of new people. And because I need reminded, and I just imagine you do too. So I remember preaching some of this in 2014 and 15 when we were starting to lay the foundations of this building. And just to give you a, a, a little bit of background, those of you that are newer to, to this body, this building has um, 20 main pier pads. Now what a pier pad is, if you know about pre-engineered steel construction, it's that big old chunk of concrete that goes down below Doug's foundation. We got a foundation. Doug made the foundation. But below that, and, and in addition to the footer and the foundation, we have pier pads. And that's required to get these big beams bolted into place and get them up. Once they're all tied together, you probably don't need it quite as much at that, but that's what holds this place together. That's what's important. Each one of those, we poured a, a pier pad under the pier, and we wrote scripture on it, 20 scriptures with 20 different elders and ministers writing their scriptures on there. Jeanette, you remember writing that on there with Brother Dick, and it was so critical. I think yours is one of the front ones. Is that right? It wasn't the front then, was it? <laughs> and Dave Kiner, I believe, has one right out there by the door. He, he's, him and Dick were the chief greeters of this place for years. And so uh, we did that, and then we poured the pier itself on there. Now that creates five more sides, four sides and a top. So we put scriptures 120 people went out with markers and took their Bibles and wrote scriptures on all of that. So there's 120 scriptures. So 20 pads times 5 is 100, and then 20 elders is 120. That's the number of outpouring in the Bible. Remember Noah, 120. Remember the upper room, 120. Good stuff. Foundations are important. If you ever build a house, don't rush through the foundation. Don't pour the foundation at the wrong time and don't get in a hurry on the foundation. Take your time. Amen? Get the foundation good and square because I remember years ago I was building a room addition out here on a house on Ginder behind the church and... I had my laser set. I didn't know it. I rented a laser, and it was set at half-inch tolerance. 
that you back then you could adjust it. You could set it for a thousandth or a half inch. So I guess if you were doing like a dirt bike trail or something, the half inch is fine. But for a house, not so much. So we had a good time after the block layers left trying to get that building level. You know what I'm talking about, Doug? You've never done that, I'm sure. But I did, <laughs> and it wasn't fun getting it to level, but we did. And uh, it, it took some time, it took some work, and uh, I drive by there every now and then, and the, the room is still straight, and people are living there, and everything's okay. How much more in your life is it important that you get your foundations secure, that you're anchor to what matters, that you know truth, that you love truth, you welcome truth, you get in discipleship classes, get in a good grow group, connect to people that are getting it done. When you connect your life to people that are losers, how are you going to win? You go following after people because they got a pretty car? That, they just got a pretty car. That doesn't mean anything. Follow after people that are successful in getting it done and making it work and connect to them. And it, this house is full of those kind of people. I mean, there are some people here solid. The elders of this house, solid. Yes, sir. Pay attention to them. Listen to them. They might be right and you might be wrong. Build on a good foundation. Make the Word of God priority. Make church attendance priority. Make prayer priority. Amen. It's really, really critical and key. Too many Christians don't have their faith founded in truth, rooted and grounded. And that's why so much money is spent on counseling and so many churches have vast turnover and they have these big baptism Sundays and then six months later you can't find any of those people because there was no foundation to the faith. We've got to get anchored. We've got to get rooted. We've got to get planted. We've got to have a foundation. I'm, I know I'm belaboring this point, but it's really my heart cry right now is, because I'm getting these phone calls. I, I, I got a message this morning that my first cousin's daughter tried to commit suicide this week. Something's wrong with the foundation of the thinking and the foundation of the spiritual walk with the Lord and the understanding of God's love and grace to cause you to think that the answer to your life journey is to end it. So I, I want to build a little bit today. I know it's getting late. Clock's ticking. And that clock back there, it is working. I can read it. I know y'all think sometimes about noon. He forgot what time it was. No, I'm kidding. Psalm 11 and 1. Let's start here and let's see what the Word of God has to say about these foundations upon which we can build an awesome and beautiful and powerful, glorious life for the Lord Jesus. In the Lord, I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul 
hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. This ties us into last week's message. In Isaiah 58, a very familiar and much quoted and well-worn scripture to the Pentecostal charismatic world, those from among you shall build the old waste places, Isaiah 58, 12. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And where I want to bring our focus today is in Hebrews chapter 6. It starts with the word therefore. When a chapter starts with therefore, you need to go back a few verses and see what it's there for. If you don't remember anything else I said, you'll probably remember that. That was a dad joke, wasn't it, Curtis? <laughs> Verse 12 of chapter 5 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Nothing wrong with being a babe when you're a babe, but there's something very wrong with being a babe when you ought to be grown up. Smile, Jesus loves you. <laughs> but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, you can get saved and not ever use your discerning and stay a babe. But by reason of use, if you'll get busy, if you'll get in the altar and pray with some people, if you'll go out and knock on a few doors and lay hands on the sick, if you'll go out and reach the lost for Jesus and use what you've been given, then you can grow up. You'll grow up. But if you sit on your hands in church and criticize and grumble and complain, I don't mind criticism if you got an answer. You can do something about it. Amen? Pastor, we're getting crowded in here. Here's $100,000 to help toward the building. I'll take that. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, knowing, knowing all of this, that some of you are still on milk and you should be on meat, and some of you haven't been using your gifts, give me a nod. Like, oh, yep, Pastor, yeah, okay, that's me. Yep, ouch. Just grab your toe and go, ooh, help me, Lord. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Now, I have to qualify that word perfection. It's not like we're looking around and saying, you're perfect now, you're good, you're per you made it, you're perfect. Yeah, oh yeah, she's definitely perfect, perfect. Need some work, perfect. You know, <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. That perfection is not a state of uh, without flaw. That perfection means complete, whole, mature, grown up. Tying it right back into chapter 5. The, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let's go on to perfection. So when we say leaving, we're not talking about abandoning. Right? In order to build this building, we had to leave the foundation work at some point, we had to say, that's done. 
We, we've got that. That's right. We, we finished that part, but we didn't go out there in the back field behind the pond and start putting up beams. We didn't leave the foundation. We just moved on past it. Does that make sense? See, some folks think that, you know, in order to have the New Testament, you've got to abandon the Old Testament. No, 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 no. That's the foundation. Build on it. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone of this house. So let us go on into maturity. Let's, let's make a building out of this thing. Let's be lively stones, fitly framed and joined to make the house of God established for more babies to come in and exercise their senses and exercise their gifts. And let's build a big foundation, a strong foundation, deep foundation, so we can move on. Solid food, food belongs to those who are full age, that is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Last week I talked about the end. The end. So today we're going to deal with, in just the next 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to deal with two points of this. The first two points. The foundation of repentance from dead works. So we repent from something, and then there's the word and. How many understand the and principle in Scripture? The and principle. When there's a faith and works, you can't take the two apart. Repentance and baptism, you can't separate that and say, well, which one saves you? It's both and. Too many Christians are divided over stuff, just, just take both. Like, remember radio, the movie? They asked him if he wanted apple pie or pecan pie. He said, I'll have both. <laughs> Cuba Gooding Jr., great movie. Anyway, so... Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. So we repent from and faith toward. You got to have both. He saved me from sin. Well, what did he save you toward? If you don't know, you still got some work to do. You haven't completed your repentance until you get faith toward God. He saves you from sin to salvation, to something powerful, great, toward purpose. So let's talk about this real quick. First thing we'll talk about is repentance. You'd be surprised how many Christians think repentance is simply remorse. God, I'm sorry I sinned. Let's look at the two words that can be translated in the New Testament as the word repentance. The first one, and I'm not a Greek scholar, so forgive my pronunciation, but it's metalomeia or metalomeia. It means I'm sorry for what I did or sorry I got caught. An example of this is Esau. He never truly repented. And Judas, when he repented, it was mere metalamoa when he repented. All right? But the second one, repentance, is the true meaning of what we come to when we Repent for our sins. And it's metaneo or metanoia. You pronounce it however you want to pronounce it. 
metanoeo. I'm getting better at it. And I did practice. But it's the one we should really associate with when it comes to true repentance. The difference between remorse and repentance. I'm sorry. Sorry for what I did. I'm sorry I got caught at it. And true repentance, deep sorrow and the action of turning away. You can't repent for the same sin every day. Just go back and do it again, do it again, do it again. You didn't repent. You told God you were sorry, but you didn't repent of it. When you repent of it, you turn away from it. You quit doing it. So I can't help it. Yes, you can. Put your trust in the Lord. Not by might, not by power, not even your own will, but by trusting in God. Give it to him. Let him help you with it. Let him fix it for you. Let him empower you. True repentance brings power for freedom. It will empower you to freedom. When you make up your mind, I'm done with that. I'm really, really, really repenting from it. By, by carefully distinguishing these two repentances, we can understand why certain churches, denominations, institutions, and souls are driven to daily discern and deploy the Lord's will, while others are going through the motions, merely having the appearance of godliness and denying the power they are, thereof. So let's contr contrast these two species of repentance. The first, which we would just say is remorse, tends to produce more sorrow, whereas the second understands that real repentance is attended by a circumcision of the heart. The first makes us resist, if not flee from the Holy One, but the latter one catapults us into his purging embrace. The first paralyzes us in a dungeon of guilt, yet the second one offers sweet and full release, absolution. The first has us always trying to clean up on aisle seven, Judas giving back the 30 pieces of silver. The second one entails a turn toward a holy God with a turning away from any sinful behavior. The first engenders despair, defeat, hopelessness, even suicide as we shared today. Judas hung himself because he was hopeless. He was in despair. He felt guilty. The second one brings real deliverance and joyful freedom. Oh, 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 if Judas could have only found what Peter found. Peter had committed an awful sin. Peter had betrayed the Lord. Peter lied. Peter cursed. But the Bible said he fell on the cobblestone street and repented with bitter tears. And he turned and became the spokesman of the gospel Acts chapter 2 in the upper room. The first one has us wallow in tar-like guilt. The second one allows the way maker to help us defeat sin. The first one seems to stick only at the level of intellect. The second goes to the heart and the will. The first is mostly about agony for self. The second is prompted by the urge to unrupture a relationship. The first is fixated on feelings. The second one is fixated on no longer disappointing the Holy One. The first tends to be temporary, but when done right, the second one has lasting traction. Amen. Repentance from dead works. See, before we repented, we weren't just ignoring God. We were enemies of God. The works that we were doing before we repented were dead works. There's no point in you doing dead works. God doesn't want you to continue to do dead works, things that produce nothing, things that add nothing to your eternal value. Dead works. Repent from dead works. Turn away from dead works. Move into life eternal. Move into what's going to bring results, fruit, bearing fruit, abiding in the vine. 
Amen? And move toward God. This word toward, in my interpretation, just means to change direction. But I want you to see it a little bit deeper meaning than this. It's not just changing direction. It's changing motivation. It's changing power sources. If I'm driving my car in one direction and I turn around and go the other direction, I'm driving the same car, same horsepower, same gas mileage. Everything's the same. Not when you turn to God. You, you're not using the same judgment skills. You're not using the same wisdom. You're not using... You, you, gotta, you didn't just take one power source and turn it and aim it in another direction. This word towards is a, is a uh, Greek word epi, E-P-I, pronounced E-P-E-E, -E -E, epi. And it's actually an action word. It, it has power. It's imported by a greater power. When you turn towards God, that's when he jumps in. I used to see those bumper stickers, God is my co-pilot. Well, he ain't riding. He's nobody's co-pilot. I mean, it was kind of cute to think about. But really, think of, seriously, God is your co-pilot? And you're the captain? Come on. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Too many people have got God co-piloting when we need to say, Jesus, take the wheel. I saw, I saw a cute cartoon the other day, and it was, it was a picture of heaven and the Lord standing there and all these steering wheels piled up around him. He said, all the wheels Jesus took. <laughs> He's not your co-pilot. When you, when you have faith towards God, trust in God. Put your trust not in yourself anymore, but in God you can't find it in your vocabulary to say, I can't anymore. Duh. You're not driving. <laughs> Throw your hands up and let Jesus have it. Yes, Give it to him. Yes, Woo! Yes. He will get you there. You can trust in him. He's got all the power you need. He's going to help you and be with you. And he'll never leave you or forsake you. Dive into his arms. Faith toward God is the foundation of what we believe. And it's easy for me to forget that. And I, I, I know it sounds so simple. But I forget sometimes that the whole foundation of my faith is that I'm not driving. God is. I have no control of things. God does. I don't have the power to fix it, but I know the one who does. I know in whom I have believed. He's in me, and he's greater than the forces that come against me. Those arrows and spears that are shooting that David talked about. Nothing will stand if the foundations are destroyed. We've got to anchor our children in these truths. On, Don't let your kid just flippantly say, sorry. Teach them repentance. Yes, Son, you know good and well, when I walk away, you're going to hit him in the face again. You're not sorry. You, you can't wait till I leave the room so you can punch him again. That's not repentance. No. You've got to make this right. You've got to get absolution for your sin. When you disobey your parents, you sin against God, and you get absolution for that, and then you can move on, and you, you can be free from all that shame and all that guilt, and you don't want to commit suicide next week because your heart is clean, and you're right with God, and you're excited about your future. There's no hopelessness when you learn to embrace absolution from a holy, loving Father who is 
waiting anxiously, eager to forgive you of your sin. Set you free from it. Separate it so far from you as the east is from the west. Amen. He didn't just take it and move it up to tomorrow morning and dangle it out there so you could wake up tomorrow and fight the same old devil. That isn't my God. When he said he put it as far as the east is from the west, you ain't going to find it. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning and go look in the mirror and go, who are you? What'd you do with my old self? It's gone. Over. Done with. God doesn't save people so they can just keep on wallowing in their mire and muck. God doesn't save you so you can just go back to work and fit right in and go on dilly-dallying doing whatever it is you were doing. People are going to look at you and go, what in the world happened to you? Wow. They're going to come asking you for a drink of what it is you're drinking. Mark tells us how Jesus preached these foundations. In Mark 1, 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He said, come to follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Amen? Come, follow me. He didn't tell him just, you know, say you're sorry and I'll leave you to your old life. No. He said, repent. The kingdom is at hand. All right, boys. We got work to do. When you come up out of that water, a new life, a new creature, when you come up from the waters of salvation, when you arise to walk in newness of life, there's some living to do. There's some work to do. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. There's nothing back there. Lot's wife looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. Don't look back. Be the salt of the earth. Walk in him. Be the light of the world. Get busy. Jesus said, repent and believe. Follow me. When Peter finished preaching his message on the day of Pentecost, he told them what they must do. Everybody say, do. do. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We're feeling guilty. We're feeling Helpless, we're feeling remorse. What must we do? Peter said, repent. See, they were already sorry for what they had done. He, when they realized that, that the man they crucified was the Lord, they were really sorry. But they hadn't repented. You ever thought about that? If that's what repentance is, he wouldn't have had to say to them, repent. They, they were there. They had already said, whoa, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> I was out there. I was screaming, crucify him. I said, give us Barabbas. I, I'm really feeling rough right now about what I did. But Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The Apostle Paul explained his ministry in Acts 20 21, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks that repentance toward God and faith toward, everybody say toward, our Lord Jesus Christ. That word toward there is the word ice. And it is a verb expressing motion. He then declares how Jesus himself appeared and gave the essence of the gospel. Paul repeats Jesus' words to him personally. He says, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan 
Before you got saved, you were walking under the power of Satan. You say, oh, no, I was a good guy. No, you weren't that good. He just had you more deceived than he did the other folks that admitted they were a mess. He had you in a good old glaze. He's slick. From the power of Satan to the power of God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me, Jesus said. The gospel is a both and message. Repent and do. Turn and go. See the light and follow. It's, it comes right down through the scripture from one scripture to the other. From Mark to Jesus to Paul to Peter and Jesus again. And now we come to 2024. When we, you and I, must declare the whole counsel of truth to a lost and hurting world. You and I, who have been given this great opportunity, sitting in this room among scholars, pastors, elders, discipleship courses going on two, three, four times a week, sermons being preached every Sunday, we're without excuse if we don't reach the lost and hurting world. And if you don't have anything to repent about today, you hadn't done any of the nasty nine, you know. Not only did you not smoke last week, you didn't even vape. So you got nothing. I mean, you got nothing, right? All of us, each and every breathing human being in this room can repent towards God. God, I want more of you. I've decided that I, I've been following like from a little bit of a distance and I, I'm going to step it up. I'm going to, I'm going to get in step with you, Lord. I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Lord, I'm going to line up to your purpose and will for my life. I'm going to seek you. You say, well, I, I don't know what God, I don't really know what God wants me to do. i tell you what he wants you to do. He wants you to do that thing, that last thing he told you to do that you didn't do. That's what you repent of. When you, when you don't know which way to go, what to do, you feel like you're, you don't fit in, you feel like you don't know your place, just keep doing the last thing God told you to do. Be faithful in that commitment that you made. You say, oh, I'm tired, I'm burnt out. I don't know if we're going to be able to stand on eternal judgment and say, yeah, I did pretty good till I burn out. I mean, I, Jesus was going the Via Dolorosa. I, I kind of think burnout's going to pale to that business. Now, I'm not talking about, you can get burnout just going through the motions. You can get burnt out working, 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 working. You fall in love with Jesus, spend your lives passionately serving Him. He said, whatever you do, the least of these, you've done it unto me. You're not serving man when you sign on to Kim's ministry back there or Brett's ministry or Heidi's ministry. You're not serving man when you sign on to Jim Lipka. It's not about Jim's personality. It's not, it's not about signing on to discipleship class to serve man. You, you sign up to Sean and Heather's prayer ministry. Say, I'm going to pray every Thursday, Sean and Heather, for you guys as our pastors and elders. You sign on to play in the band up here. You're not serving... You're not playing for these people. You will burn out if you're up here playing for them. Because they're not going to run up here and throw money at you every week. There, there'll be weeks go by and nobody will say anything good about your music. They might even criticize. Amen? 
But whatever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I need to repent and put my faith toward God. I remember hearing when I was a teenager that God had people put their gifts on a shelf. And I was like, where in the world is that in the Bible? There's no shelf in the heavenly dimensions for your gifts. There's no reclining chair in ministry. Only altars, hands, hugs, feet, arms, voices. We've got a work to do. The old song says, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. I used to sing a song that said, just ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like you and me to do as he commands. Stand with me. Every one of us in this room have a work to do. The foundation of who we are and what we're about. I won't turn back. Is following the footsteps of I Jesus. Come to the front of this room. Prayer team, lead the way. Let's all make our way to a place of repentance. Step out in the aisle. Step up to an altar. Step over against the wall. Move your feet in response to the word of Almighty God. I'm going to follow Jesus. I have decided. Make it known to the Lord. Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to turn away from my selfishness. I'm going to turn away no from what I thought back. was right. I'm going to turn to you, Lord. No turning back. back. The world behind me. Woo! The world behind me. The cross before me. The cross before me. just to close your eyes where you are if you're standing or seated just close your eyes for just a moment if you're standing here today and you say as I've heard the word today I know that I'm not in a truly repentant place 
I want you to lift your hand just enough so I can see you and pray for you. I really have some work to do in this thing of repentance. Every eye closed, no one looking around. I see those hands. I'm coming across. Just keep them up for just a moment. This is a serious proclamation that you're making right now. Lord, I'm moving in. I'm coming closer. I'm repenting. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now I want all of us to pray for somebody nearby so everyone gets touched. So just begin to walk around, turn around, look around, elders, pastors, altar workers, deacons, saints, reach out, begin to touch somebody. Let's pray. Oh God, oh God, give me true repentance. That's it. That's it, brother to brother. Yeah, reach out to that couple right there. Pray with that person right there. I won't turn back. I have decided. Turning away from you, world, turning away from myself, my old ways. That's it, that's it, that's it. God's doing a work on hearts right now. Jesus, Jesus. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. I'm not looking back. I'm not going with the elements of this world. I'm not walking in the rudiments of this world. you prayed a little bit is there anyone that would like to make a fresh start in your walk with the Lord today you, you've come to a turning point in your marriage in your walk with the Lord you've come to a turning place in your life maybe God's called you to something today maybe maybe you've got a fresh start in your spirit today would you come and let me pray with you Say, I, I've been praying, I feel this, I want to make a new start. Doesn't mean you're backslid, it doesn't mean you're evil. Don't wait till you're on your deathbed to say those words, I repent. Don't waste your years. Don't even waste another second. That's right. Don't do it. Do it now. Now is the time. I'm going to start for Jesus. We want to pray for you. We want to help you. You need to make a step. You need to make a move. You can't just make up your mind to do it. You got to you got to act turn and follow repent and do this is a good time it's a safe place for you to put action on your faith move your faith towards God amen, amen. we're here for you we, there's no one in this room that hasn't 
at some point in time in their Christian walk had to make a walk to the front and get some prayer and some help. It's, it's not a shameful thing to do at all. Pastors, preachers, saints, we all have to do it. We all need prayer. We all need one another. Amen? Amen. 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 Did you know God loves you? Amen. Did you know Pastor Paul loves you? Yes. Amen. Lord, I bless you and I thank you. I pray for those that are standing in this room today, Lord, who've reached out their hand for help. I pray, Lord, that you give clear understanding and clear direction. I pray, Lord, that you anoint and bless the hearts that are pure and hungry. Use us for your glory, Lord. Let us be a testimony, God, to your goodness and your grace. Lord, make us vessels of honor, vessels to be used in this last day, in this hour, O oh God, when the world is hungry and hurting. Use us for your glory. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done in the Williams family, in the Cousins family. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done in the Wise family, Jesus. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in the Weldon family, in the Williams family, in the Edmonds family, Jesus, the Raider family, the Beringer family. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Hamiltons and the Georges. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Everybody said amen. 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 What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming today and for being attentive to the Word and for your hunger. Get in your Bible and look up the word foundations and begin to study that out. We're going to be on that at least one more week. Next week I'll be speaking again. Bring someone with you next week to hear the Word of the Lord. We love you. You're dismissed. And uh, I don't know what's on that table out there, but it looks like something's out there. Something's up. Valentine's Cakes. cakes. Woohoo! Little Debbie is here. <laughs>